Nightmare was the first song off the record, which I was like, okay, there it is. There's the sound of Franzoli. Franzoli? Where did you get that name from? Dictionary.com. I was like looking up words, but it was like their word of the day. So it was uh, something unnecessary out of this decoration. And I felt like that encompassed bone crumpets pretty perfectly. to get yourself together after a tour and preparing for a new album. How was that? Well, I thought it would be easy when I came home, but obviously, because all your ideas are sort of running around. And when you're on tour, you're as closest to your instrument as possible, but you're really far away from writing anything. You're kind of going over the motions of playing the songs you were playing live. To kind of come home and write, you end up getting all the weird ideas that you want to get out, but not necessarily the ones that you think would sound Good, so I just wrote as much as possible. I was trying to write a song a day if I felt like there was an idea there, but I always try to finish everything, even if it sounds bad, and then I like, have a good tendency to throw things away quite quickly. So it will be my favorite tune for about half an hour, and then it's in the bin. So. But these ones, yeah, these ones felt like they, uh, they still sound good to me now. Ladies and gentlemen. What is the real storyline of All Aboard Steamship Sinker? What is that storyline? <laughs> <laughs> that is about a friend. He is the SS Sinker. We kind of called him that because every time we go out with him, something bad happens. But then I suppose the older you get, the bad behavior isn't as bad as probably what it seemed like when you were 18. Staying out past 12 o'clock is bad behavior now, isn't it? Once you're over 30. Is that comparable to Pillhouse and Mr. and Mrs. Mycentro? All people that you know? Yeah, I suppose. It is a, it's all like diary-esque, like people that have been around or influenced myself or little tales of Perth or even on tour. Mr. and Mrs. Misanthrope came from like, we call that, our neighbors across the road kind of have that sort of like glim look on life. So I sort of gave them a story and that sort of became their, their world. Whereas Pillhouse, Puff of Moonshine was, uh, that was like two songs put together as one actually. My friend, he was making Moonshine. So it was like, uh, uh, that's why I have to wear glasses now, like, because I was drinking. Nah, it wasn't. They were, my eyes have always been bad, but yeah, that story kind of came from him. And I kind of gave it that, like, almost. I don't know. What was that Arctic Monkey song where it was like, this house is a circus? Something like It was like, I love those lyrics. And I was like, all right, I'm gonna try and create something a bit more in that world, so. And then the riff kind of came along. I think the, the music kind of comes first and the lyrics I should spend more time on. That's something I've definitely learned from this record. I try and create the song and finish it in a day. And the, the music I'll spend as, I don't know, a bunch of time thinking about where it can go, what can happen, where it's gonna to lead to, and then the lyrics, I'm like, okay, here it goes, there's the lyrics. And I 
think this album, when people are like, oh, we can hear your voice for the first time, like, and then I'm like, yeah, it's kind of nonsensical. I kind of left that in a, <laughs> should have been like, all right, now I, sh- I want to do some David Foster Wallace thing where it's like maybe actually meaning something on the next one. So, But then every album is you've got to, got to learn from the last and progress with it, else we're just going to keep writing the same record over and over again. We're 14, 15 months away from our last meeting in the studio Artone in Haarlem, where I recorded mm. five songs, Tally Ho, Lava Lamp Pisco, Mundungus, Bill's Mandolin, and Him for a Droid. What do you remind best of that day? <laughs> I feel the studio was incredible. We all talk about that studio still. And um, obviously the amount of old equipment and gear they had, it was like, you don't really see that in Australia, being able to have so much, uh, was it like analog equipment, but has been kept and modified up with the times. Rather, rather we just get the new stuff that comes out. There isn't too many relics lying around in Australia. But also the whole pressing plant, the vinyl pressing plant was uh, really impressive. We're all in the good headspace to kind of keep it presently rolling. And like, if this is as the highest it gets, then we're all grateful and really stoked with it. But then if it does go to another level, then I think it's nice to have that sort of like humbleness to be like, cool. It's already way bigger than any of us thought it would be. I didn't think we'd ever get out of the bedroom. When you left our studio, you were off for the United States. Yeah, we were. We had a, we had a little gap in between. Um, we all went and did a little bit of a trip, like a holiday. So I went to Greece for like the first time with, with the missus. And, and then we ended up in, yeah, in America. That was, that was a mad tour, that one. Our van broke down. We had all sorts of issues, but it was a, it was a fun one. Oh, a lot of good memories, but I mean, it's a long place, isn't it? It's sort of like the size of Europe without the languages, so it's all just English speaking. But then the roads are like eight hour drives before you get anywhere, really. So not too many castles on the way to her stop off and see. So. <laughs> There was a time where I really wanted to be at home. I kind of had given up on the thought of music being a career or a job. And it was almost like pushing a big, heavy wheelbarrow uphill, especially with COVID, where you were just like, oh man, like, uh, let's start thinking about other jobs and what we can do. But that was even before Crumpets had sort of finished. So we already had this mentality where it was over. And I was like, all right, like, we've got to go and do something else now. Instead of thinking that way, let's start our own. We'll go back to the label approach, we'll self-release it. If we fail, we fail on our own accord and we don't owe anyone to anything. It's just, there it is. We toured more and we went to these places and we did some meet and greets beforehand and try and have a beer with everyone at the show and try and create a little community around it. It was like, let's just aim for 400 people in this tiny town in America. Or let's do it like in Europe or these places. And I think that seems to have really honed us in on maybe something that was achievable rather than, I don't know, every band sort of has that grand plan of being like, we're gonna headline Glastonbury to be a real band. Whereas I think us were like, all right, if we can just go and do as many shows as possible and take it six months at a time, it, it feels like there's a lot less to chew that we can really kind of hone in on where we want to go and just keep writing music. We can do an album a year, a bunch of shows around it, and then keep going. I think it seems to work. <laughs> 